Well, that's when, you know, you have these two schools, and one of them's black and one of them's white, and you mix the student body and the faculty. That's the Princeton plan. I said, oh, you mean that, that, that's what they did when I was in fifth grade? It seemed to have been a very smooth plan. In fact, it, was, it happened before you knew it. Unless you had children who were in those schools, you probably didn't notice it too much. The whole process, to me, the way I, I see things, was wrong from the beginning. I think that neighborhood schools should have never been broken up. It was, uh, it was a good feeling, because uh, I think most of us in the whole picture felt that it was the right thing to do, that we were making a step forward. It just didn't seem to make sense to have an integrated high school and have a segregated elementary school. We were joking about something in class one time, and the student said, look at Shirley blush. And I remember the teacher saying in class, Shirley can't blush, Negroes don't blush. So there were little comments like that that, uh, you know, let us know that um, we were different. The Princeton community itself had a feeling, not just the school system, but the whole community, that it had reached a point where we needed to work together. And I think the whole community made a real effort to make the plan work. There were uh, 81 members in the Constitutional Convention. Eight of them were women. Only one was an African American and that was Delegate Randolph from uh, Essex County. And it was, I think, very largely through his influence, his insistence, that a very liberal civil rights uh, plank, if you will, was inserted in the Constitution of 1947. My opinion is that the convention wants to go on record as favoring the broadest clause against discrimination against race, color, or national origin. Article 1, paragraph 5, prohibits racial segregation in two important areas of, if you will, the public life of the state. Um, segregation in public schools is forbidden, and segregation in the state militia is forbidden. It was a very important provision, and one that was swiftly implemented as of 1947, for example, we still had segregated schools in New Jersey. In the southern counties of the state, in Princeton, even in Englewood, New Jersey, segregated schools. It is the first state constitution in the Union that prohibits racial discrimination in the state militia and in public schools. And that sent out a, if you will, a death knell to such um, discriminations in other state constitutions. Um, I should also say that, uh, in, in, in a sense, the whole world was watching New Jersey in 47. One guy we know who was watching New Jersey was Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, around this period of time, was beginning the long process which would lead to the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, the Supreme Court decision. Because New, New Jersey desegregated its schools, the NAACP could argue, and it argued well, that desegregation of schools was in keeping with the spirit of American democracy, it was in keeping with the spirit of the United States Constitution, and the court could point to New Jersey as an example of a state that voluntarily desegregated its schools, and it did so without racial um, 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 havoc. In 1948, there were 2,000 students in the Princeton schools. 11% of the students were black. In Princeton's segregated school system, the borough had two elementary schools about nine blocks apart. The black school was Witherspoon, and the white school was Nassau. The township, a large rural area that surrounded the small developed borough, also had two elementary schools, but it paid the borough to educate all of its black elementary students. In response to the constitutional mandate, 
the Township Board of Education announced in early March of 1948 that they would stop sending their black elementary students to the Witherspoon School. The township's decision is said to have hastened the borough's plan to desegregate its schools, and the superintendent, along with the Board of Education, moved fast, giving no time for opposition to develop. It's acted at the beginning like an ordinary PTA meeting, and then the president announced that the Board of Education of the Princeton Borough Schools, there, it was not a regional school district at the time, had uh, voted to effect an integration between the then colored school and the then white school. It started out <laughs> rather quietly and then it got a little tense because there were people who said, uh, this action is going too fast. They should have been more slowly. I mean, they should have acted more slowly. There was no reason for hurry, but there were those who felt they could have uh, dragged their feet a little bit and maybe educated the public a little more because most people hadn't heard anything about this possibility, or if they'd heard, they thought it was somewhere in the future and maybe their children would have graduated from school before it got done. Um, so there was some tension, and there were certain uh, people who were quite deeply uh, shocked and horrified at the thought of their children having to go into the John Witherspoon area. This was the Nassau Street uh, PTA, you understand, so it was all, all white folk. Some of us felt that a PTA meeting should get over with pretty soon, so I said, I move that the Nassau Street PTA endorse the action of the Board of Education in making this plan to integrate the schools. Um, and it passed with a few dissenting votes. The majority thought it was a fine decision and were uh, all for what the Board of Education had done. There were a few people who didn't want to speak to me for some years afterward. The Board of Education during the course of the summer had several um, open houses at both schools, at the Nassau Street School and the Quarry Street School, and invited parents to come and take a tour of the school, meet teachers, so that uh, parents both from the John Witherspoon area who had not maybe known anything much about the Nassau Street School, had the opportunity to see it and to meet the teachers, all the teachers. Um, and the, the reverse happened also. That is, parents who probably had never ventured down Witherspoon Street as far as Quarry Street um, had that experience and found that it was a very nice school. Press coverage of the integration process by the local papers was sketchy at best. They used the terms centralization, reorganization, and changes. Not integration or desegregation. Only one paper explained that colored children would now be going to the same schools as white children. The superintendent of schools and I, and also Howard Waxwood, who was, was the principal of the Witherspoon School, sometimes called the Quarry Street School, uh, we visited several civic groups in the community, such as the uh, Rotary Club and the Qantas Club, several church groups along the way, where we discussed this whole matter. And I might add that the, the spirit and the kind of questions that were asked at these occasions were, were not in the... Uh, the least bit uh, antagonistic. It was almost as though this is being accepted and uh, it is a, it's a good thing that should be done. The people, the government realized that there, there was uh, inferiority being placed upon us and enough in government had the conscience to say let's change it and give the blacks a better opportunity. There were questions at that time by uh, people in our black community about the, their little children having to walk a greater distance 
to get to their elementary school. It was in their own backyard at, at that particular time. And uh, so there was some reluctance on the part of our black parents uh, because of the safety factor. And there was also another thing that I think is very important here. The teachers in the Witherspoon School were loved by the parents and by their principal and highly respected. And uh, that was, they felt that they were losing something uh, by having their teachers, uh, so to speak, taken away from the home grounds. The Negro parents were concerned about how their children would be treated, how the white teachers would treat them, uh, just in, and how the white students, what, what, what could they expect? They had been segregated, they had been separated and kept together. They had a fear of being rejected. And I think that through all of this, he tried uh, as best he could to prepare them. To him, this was important that he try to get those young people, those students and teachers to understand what was happening and that it was not going to be a very easy situation. It was going to be one of give and take, of uh, compromise, but of trying to understand that being a part of this was going to mean the welfare of all concerned. Some of them were white parents, they were wondering whether it would uh, uh, really uh, uh, downgrade, in effect, uh, some of the academic standards of the school. However, the interesting part of that is and, uh, that we kept very careful records on that, and we found that actually that our Stanford achievement tests were showing better results in the integrated school system than they were in the segregated school system. So uh, there was, uh, that was one of the pluses, I think, in the, in the whole movement. Now the two segregated elementary schools, Nassau and Witherspoon, were integrated. All the younger black and white students, kindergarten through fifth grade, were assigned to the formerly white Nassau school, and all the sixth through eighth graders were assigned to the formerly black Witherspoon school. The first day when I went to school, um, I noticed that the students weren't very receptive to us. Um, I was kind of nervous because I didn't understand why we were changing schools. Uh, the concept wasn't given to us as students, it was only given to the parents and the people in the community. You know, I just noticed that we were different. And that's the first time, as I said, that I noticed what segregation was when they integrated the schools. Because we were clearly, uh, we weren't told that we were different, but we were treated differently. The teachers did not discipline us the same when we went to Nassau Street School. We saw it as a lack of caring because it wasn't the same type of caring that we had before we um, left Witherspoon. Our teachers I knew every since as a kid because they lived in the neighborhood. They were at the house. They were in the church. Um, they were really concerned about us. Um, we were just like a big family. Uh, and when we got to Nassau Street School, I got the impression uh, that we were just about ignored. Uh, I know one of the, uh, we used to compete among ourselves. We weren't asked to answer questions. I was assigned to Mrs. Scruggs's class, uh, who was the black teacher who had come over to, to take the other section of fifth grade. And, but she turned out to be one of the greatest teachers I've had. And I have been blessed with um, many, many really incredible teachers. Um, she was one of the best. She was incredibly caring, nurturing, um, she listened, she, she heard what, 
what you had to say. Um, she was encouraging. Um, I particularly remember about her that she uh, encouraged, she was, she was the first person who, who, who encouraged me to write. She, I, I wrote a piece uh, for one of her classes, uh, and, and she, she actually called my mother to tell her how splendid she thought this piece of writing was. Well, to me, you know, good writing up until that was penmanship. And I had terrible penmanship. I was totally puzzled by her thinking that this piece of writing was good, because it was the same penmanship that I'd always had. But of course, she meant something quite different from that. Um, so um, in 1973, I published a book. I dedicated it to her. A teacher, Mr. Horner, a music teacher, uh, singled me out in a class to sing Short and Bread. And uh, I refused, and I guess we had some words, and he sent me back to Mr. to the principal's office. And uh, Mr. Waxwood had, and I had a long, long talk, and he just told me about, about integration and about uh, experiences that I would have in life. And I'll never forget the things that he sat down and talked to me about. He told me that subconsciously, White people don't realize at times what they're doing and uh, how they, how you feel about things. Because after all, Mr. Waxwood himself, as a student in the, in the school system here in Princeton, New Jersey, was rejected, was humiliated. But through it all, he kept fighting. He didn't give up, and I think that was what he tried to get those students to keep going and not to give up, not to feel that there's no hope, but always feel that tomorrow will be a better day. There was good chemistry between Howard and me, and uh, we knew we had a big job on our hands and that it was going to rise or fall pretty much on, on our shoulders one way or the other. So, uh, but uh, it was a happy experience as I look back on it all. It was still a Jim Crow town though, and, and Princeton always had that aura. But ever since Paul Robeson's time when he had gone to school for colored children when it was on Witherspoon Street, he said that phrase that uh, Princeton is the southernmost northern town. And we still knew that we had we had to stay in our place. It's just that because of the times, the integration took place in Princeton. But I think people still had, some people still had their same views because there were places we couldn't go. There were restaurants we couldn't go into even though the schools were, set, were integrated. Blacks and whites were mixed in the Princeton schools in 1948 and lives were changed. But the integration process in the Princeton schools did not become commonly known as the Princeton Plan until the 60s, when a New Jersey newspaper published the first of many articles on desegregation in Princeton. I don't care where you went, it was the Princeton Plan. So uh, naturally we felt proud <laughs> to be a part of something of that plan that, uh, that everybody is picking up on, that we must have been doing, it must have been something good because uh, it, it spread, and other, other cities took on the, some phase of the Princeton plan. The education, for some reason, seemed to go down a little bit when they integrated the schools. And this, it was especially felt in the high school, because um, we were tracked. We were tracked in general, uh, business, industrial, and academic. And for whatever reason, we were not put in the academic classes. Our parents had to come and uh, tell them that we wanted to be an academic and be prepared for college. This was one of the most uh, uh, rewarding and profound experiences in my life because it helped me to get to know black people and black children in a way that I might not, not have done otherwise. It was like a breath of fresh air to see uh, all this thing coming together with uh, good people of goodwill. The Witherspoon Street School after the integration was really quite, quite uh, a good community of both African-American and white kids in many ways. 
I still feel as though I was cheated out of a lot by um, by being a part of that plan. I was pleased, uh, amused, proud of, of Princeton for, you know, having been a pioneer in this. In the integrated school system, all of the children would have books, they would have writing materials, they would have teachers teaching courses that were not taught at his school. Uh, so he had a feeling that this had to be better if for no other reason that every child had a good book and didn't have a second-hand one that was, had come down from another school but had the same kinds of material, the same books, the same pencils, the same drawing material. He, if for no other reason he felt that, the, that his students that those students were getting what they had missed in a segregated school.